Hi everyone, so the title of my talk is Andrew Kaufman is Wrong About COVID-19, Part 2, Kerry Mullis and James Hildreth. So here's a disclaimer, the intention of this video is twofold. Uh, first is to discuss the claims made by psychiatrist Dr. Andrew Kaufman uh, and Dr. Thomas Cowan regarding Dr. Kerry Mullis, the inventor of PCR, uh, and the second is to discuss the claims made by Andrew Kaufman regarding Dr. James Hildreth. The views expressed in this video are not the opinions of the creator of the video. Please make your own conclusions after the video. So my first video, which was titled Andrew Kaufman is Wrong about COVID-19, Scientific Evidence, a Molecular Biology Perspective. Um, I believe in this video I showed very nicely that um, Andrew Kaufman is not qualified to talk about the molecular details regarding SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, and that he's deliberately presenting misinformation. So here you can see that uh, in this image here, I was showing how he sort of pulled up this random image which he claimed were exosomes and then tried to com compare them to viral particles. Uh, this was misinformation. He provided no reference. Uh, we don't know what these things are. Uh, and then here was this table that he presented. Uh, again, this table was filled with misinformation. He literally just uh, cherry-picked data and it wasn't even correct data he just made this table to try to say that exosomes are similar to what he's calling COVID-19 but what he means is SARS coronavirus 2 um, so he's deliberately presenting misinformation uh, really claiming that the entire scientific community is wrong while not publishing any scientific data of his own um, so really in doing so he's endangering people uh, by claiming that SARS coronavirus 2 is not real um, which he stated many times. Okay, so now we're going to get into um, Kerry Mullis. So he's the inventor of polymerase chain reaction. And Andrew Kaufman claims that Kerry Mullis stated, you cannot use this test, which is PCR, to either prove infectious ideology or to diagnose an infectious disease. Um, and so where he's actually getting this from is, uh, I couldn't find the actual video of Andrew Kaufman saying it. I know I've seen him say it. Um, but I, I tried, I watched a couple hours of his stuff today and I couldn't sit through any more to be honest. So I, uh, but I did find this video of Dr. Tem Thomas Cowan. So I'm gonna play this here uh, and I believe this is what he's referring to. The test is called a RT-PCR test. It's otherwise known as a viral load test. And the test is a surrogate test. It was, it was developed and by a guy named Kerry Mullis, who was given the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for essentially inventing the technique of this test. And he said very specifically, you cannot use this test to either prove infectious etiology or to diagnose an infectious disease. All right, so there's that quote there. So this is what Andrew Kaufman is referring to. Um, and here is where I believe they're claiming that this quote comes from. So this is a, an article called Questioning the HIV AIDS Hypothesis, 30 Years of Dissent. Um, this is written by Patricia Goodson and it was retracted. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, uh, that doesn't really matter for this. Um, but in it, it states that Kerry Mullis, um, it's sort of paraphrasing him here. Uh, some of it is a quote, um, but it's really saying that PCR is intended to identify substances qualitatively, but by its very nature is unsuited for estimating numbers. Um, and he states here that these tests cannot detect free infectious viruses at all, okay? That the tests can detect genetic sequences of viruses, but not the viruses themselves. So this is important. The wording here is very important. First, I wanna point out this word qualitatively. So we all know what quantitative is, like numbers, Qualitative is, you know, very simple, red versus blue, round versus square, human versus virus, okay? These are not numbers, these are just qualities. Um, and so this, this uh, paraphrasing of what Carrie Mullis had supposedly said really is suggesting that these tests can detect genetic sequences of viruses. So I'm gonna go a lot deeper into this and I'm gonna show you why this is so wrong. Um, so there's the quote, um, here is the uh, misquote, but really if you look at this quote here, uh, this is the misrepresentation of the quote, if you look at this, uh, this paragraph here, really what it says is PCR is suitable, can detect uh, genetic sequences of viruses qualitatively, 
okay? So it can identify substances qualitatively, and it can detect genetic sequences of viruses. And this is really all that it's being used for, okay? Um, so this is an applied biosystems protocol, one of the uh, kits that's being used to detect um, here for the detection of nucleic acids from SARS coronavirus 2. Um, they're not using it to diagnose disease. Uh, it states very clearly that it's for the qualitative detection of nucleic acid from SARS coronavirus 2. And this is almost exactly what is stated um, in that uh, paragraph um, representing what Kerry Mullis had said. Um, again, so PCR is suitable to detect genetic sequences of viruses qualitatively. That's all they're looking for here. And if you actually read this document, I'm gonna put a link in the description. You can read the whole thing yourself. Uh, it's very inclusive um, and detailed. And also it recommends in here, this is a line from the document, um, that the PCR tests are meant to go along with serum specimen, um, serological testing. So essentially antibody tests to go along with all positive PCR results. Um, so they're not just looking at the PCR to diagnose the infectious disease, they also want to see antibodies. And if you go through the document, there's a whole list of possible complications and limitations of the test. Um, these are done at specialized testing facilities uh, by people who are following these protocols to a T. So um, really, you have to understand that the PCR is not being um, uh, used improperly here. And I'm gonna show you later uh, how prevalent it really is uh, and how it's been used for decades for the same purpose. So here's the original patent. Um, this is the patent um, that I pulled up. Again, you could just Google search this. It's very easy to find this document. Um, and this is by Carrie B. Mullis uh, for the process of amplifying, detecting, and or cloning nucleic acid sequences. I don't know if this is the actual original document because he was affiliated with the Cetus Corporation that he worked for, um, but this is one of the original, if not the original document, okay? And uh, if you read some of the details here, I'm just going to walk you through some of them. Um, so this is a process for amplification of existing nucleic acid sequences if they are present in a test sample and detecting them if present by using a probe. So I mentioned that in my last video uh, about the probes. Um, the DNA and RNA may be single or double-stranded and may be relatively pure species or a component of a mixture of nucleic acids. So remember, Andrew Kaufman was saying when they get this uh, sputum from the patient's lungs, because there's so much different genetic material in there, how do you know what you're amplifying? Well, this is the original document from Kerry Mullis stating that you can actually use PCR for RNA or DNA uh, with relatively pure species or a component of a mixture of nucleic acids. So even with those other human nucleic acids present, this test is specific enough to target the ones that you intend to target. Okay. Um, as well, in this document, it also states that you can use it for various infectious diseases to be diagnosed. So this completely goes against the quote that, Car um, that they claim that Kerry Mullis said that you can't use it to detect, um, you know, to diagnose infectious diseases. Uh, and as well, it says these include bacteria such as Salmonella, Chlamydia, and Neisseria, viruses such as hepatitis viruses, and parasites such as Plasmodium. Okay, so you can use it for viruses and for infectious diseases. Um, as well, if you look here, it says enable the detection and or characterization of specific nucleic acid sequences associated with infectious diseases, genetic disorders, or cellular disorders such as cancer. Again, um, and later on it mentions infectious diseases again, so it's mentioned uh, twice again. So you really can use this to detect um, or at least look for nucleic acid sequences of infectious diseases. So in this way, um, the quote or the misquote by Andrew Kaufman and uh, Cohen is really wrong here. Uh, PCR is suitable for testing genetic material of infectious diseases, including viruses, as explicitly stated by Kerry Mullis in his patent document. Um, really, if you look further at this, this also talks about the specific sequences uh, suspected of being present. So this is what I showed you in my last video when you're looking at targeting specific SARS coronavirus 2 uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase sequences that are present only in that genome. So um, uh, this is an image from the patent document. It's kind of low resolution, but I tried to zoom in on a section here. And this is showing the same sequence complementarity. This would be the probe or primer here, um, and it would extend uh, out this way on the target 
um, nucleic acid sequence and again there's this complementarity so this probe is not designed to target um, in the in the case of SARS coronavirus 2 it's going to target the uh, whether it be a sequence of one of the other proteins or uh, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase proteins or genes I should say that are specific to that virus okay um, so here it's a specific sequence and it can be viral uh, and this is stated um, you know by Kerry Mullis in this original document okay so in this way you really get a uh, a case of broken telephone here um, so here's some YouTube comments this person says I don't see a problem with Kaufman's talk on exosomes he does mention elsewhere that they are much smaller than the cell um, and the inventor of PCR himself said it cannot be used to diagnose COVID um, the package actually says it so first of all I already demonstrated uh, in my first video there um, about Andrew Kaufman that he doesn't know what he's talking about regarding exosomes and he's not qualified to speak about them at a molecular level uh, or at any level I should say um, and I don't know what package he's referring to here but really this is a case of uh, this person just following kind of every word he says and uh, following the misquote that Kerry Mullis actually said you can't use it to diagnose uh, you can't use PCR to diagnose COVID um, Kerry Mullis again wasn't even alive when COVID started. I believe he died in August 2019. Um, so I don't know what this is referring to, um, but you're, um, the people are really being a little misled by these misquotes. Uh, and this one, I really like this comment. Um, the bones of Carrie Mullins are trembling from these lies in this video. Uh, so this person didn't even uh, Google Carrie Mullis. They can't even spell the name. They don't even know really what the hell they're talking about. So they've just blindly followed Andrew Kaufman here. Um, and I also want to just briefly point out, um, you can actually see, so if you go to the patent document itself, um, if you actually search, uh, I'm going to search the word virus here, look at all of the um, terms that come up. So all of these yellow lines obviously uh, represent where virus shows up the, uh, in this document. Um, these are other patents that have been filed modifications to PCR or at least uh, different uses for PCR to detect or uh, in some sort of a form used with viruses okay composition compositions and methods for detecting or quantifying hepatitis B virus okay 2016 um, the list goes on I'm just gonna um, go through this here so if you actually go through this I can go back to the top of the document to sort of show you how long this has been used for um, Okay, so if you just go through here, um, there we go. So uh, if you go through here, you can see detection of AIDS associated virus by polymerase chain reaction, um, methods for detecting pico corona. Uh, coronaviruses in biological fluids and tissues and this is from 1989 um, the list goes on okay probes for detection of human papillomavirus um, it, it just goes on and on so there's been a ton of uses for viruses uh, bovine herpes virus one detection um, so PCR has been used for these purposes for decades okay and billions of dollars have been put into these patents and protocols uh, and this just simply would not be done if it didn't work um, for these purposes. Um, scientists do sometimes make mistakes, but there's just no way that a mistake like this would be made over and over again with billions and billions of dollars invested. Um, and not only that, uh, for someone to actually claim something like that, they would have to actually write a science paper. So someone would have to actually, like Andrew Kaufman, if he wants to make the claim that all scientists are wrong about PCR, he has to write a science paper, do the research, present it, get it peer reviewed, and present it. Uh, he could, if he doesn't believe that the correct journals are going to publish it, he can make his own journal um, and then publish it in his own peer reviewed journal and get this information out there. Um, so if he does that and he wants to, you know, try to debunk all of these, uh, like this is just extensive. I mean, the amount that PCR is used, these are just the patents that are used that I'm showing you. Um, for all kinds of uses as well as viruses. It's used for many other applications in science, okay? Um, so again, uh, this is just sort of showing you the level of misinterpretation and misinformation that's being presented 
uh, when he's stating something that uh, Kerry Mullis didn't even say. Okay, so there's really uh, a lack of critical thinking amongst some of the followers. That's what I wanted to point out with these comments. Um, so really, uh, Andrew Kaufman and Thomas Cowan are misquoting Kerry Mullis. Um, they are misquoting someone who cannot defend themselves because they passed away. Um, they're using misinformation to support false claims, uh, and they're doing little to no research. Um, you know, as I've shown, they just uh, this patent document, they could have pulled it up very easily. I pulled it up, uh, it was the first thing that came up when I searched uh, Kerry Mullis PCR patent. So they could have done this themselves, um, they didn't. Um, so they're really confusing their listeners um, by stating this misinformation. And again, this endangers people by suggesting that improper testing for COVID-19 means that a virus is not the cause of the disease. Um, so, you know, telling people to ignore these quarantines, um, ignore the social isolation. And again, I will just note, um, I'm doing it as well, obviously, I'm affected by this. Um, it's only been a few months so far, um, whether it's putting on a mask, whether it's uh, doing these things, it's not that inconvenient so far. I mean, I must say I've done much more tedious things in my life than this. Um, you know, working from home especially, I mean, it's not that bad uh, for now. Anyway, so uh, James Hildreth uh, is an immunologist. So here now I'm going to get into the, the claims made by uh, James Hildreth, uh, or at least by Andrew Kaufman about James Hildreth. So he's been throwing around this quote, the virus is fully an exosome in every sense of the word. Um, and really what he's doing here is he's saying that um, he's claiming that James Hildreth's comments suggest that no scientist can tell the difference between exosomes and viruses. Uh, this is essentially what he's saying when he says that the virus is fully an exosome. Okay, and he is completely wrong uh, and he's misinterpreted what James Hildreth has said. So I'm going to show you a quick video of uh, Andrew Kaufman here. So I happen to um, uh, be looking in the virology literature and actually they also think exosomes and viruses are uh, possibly the same thing. So this is James, Dr. James Hildreth, a very prominent uh, researcher and academic physician in the field of virology and HIV research. The virus is fully an exosome in every sense of the word. Now this was just a great confirmation for what I was already thinking and I was kind of blown away when I read this in the paper because uh, this was one of the last papers I looked at um, to find this after I had already come to the same conclusion it really helped validate my opinion. Okay, so he said a lot of information there. Um, I mean, really what I'm going to focus on first is that he says um, that this is the last paper he looked at in the virology literature, suggesting that he had been going through this for a long time, um, he's really well versed in it, uh, and this is the last paper he found. Um, now I'm just going to show you here, if you go to Google and you search virus exosome, very simple search, um, this is actually the first paper to come up, okay? Um, so I'm just going to ask you, I'm not going to uh, tell you my thoughts, but is this the last paper he looked at in the virology literature or is this the first Google search of virus exosome? Um, so I want you to decide, uh, is he lying here? Okay. Uh, and as well, this is not the first time that this has happened. So uh, he claimed before that he had done uh, extensive reading of the literature. Uh, when he was talking about exosomes, if you just search exosomes microscope, uh, this is one of the main papers that he refers to in his uh, in his video about exosomes, okay? And again, I showed you in my last video how he misinterprets this image, how he thinks that this entire uh, structure here is an exosome, and he's wrong. The exosomes are these little guys here. Um, but again, this is just showing that he really seems to be um, Google searching things and then choosing pretty much the first thing that comes up. So he claims to be going through the scientific literature, uh, and I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you think? Based on what I've just shown you, um, do you think he's really going through it extensively? Um, and so really now I'm gonna get back to, that was just kind of a side, I just wanted to show you um, some of the low level research that's being done here. Um, so here we look at the uh, HIV replication cycle. This is getting back to what James Hildreth was talking about when he says the virus is fully an exosome in every sense of the word. So I want you, I'm going to give you a little background here so that you kind of understand uh, what he was actually talking about and how, um, how much Andrew Kaufman has taken this quote out of context. Okay, and I will also mention before I get into this, 
Um, he mentions in that video that he was looking for quotes to confirm what he had said. Um, this is kind of backwards science. That's not the way science is done. Uh, the way science is done is that you have a hypothesis and you design the experiments um, to try to really prove it wrong. And if, you, if you're at the point where you can't really find anything wrong with it, or at least uh, you can't prove it wrong, then you start to get some data that you can try to publish. So that's the way science is done uh, by Andrew Kaufman having an idea, searching uh, virus exosome and pulling up the first paper he finds. Um, that's really the opposite of scientific research. So anyway, um, in order to understand what this quote really means, we're going to look at the HIV replication cycle here. Um, so I'll just give you a very brief overview of what's going on here, just so that you can kind of understand uh, what this quote means. So this is an infectious virion. Virion just means a viral particle with a genome inside that's capable of replicating um, inside the host. So this is a representative of an HIV uh, viral particle. So here the HIV is going to attach to a CD4 positive T cell um, and it attaches at the CD4 receptor as well as CCR5 or CXCR4. Um, so these attachment points are uh, what viruses use to get into host cells. Uh, if you remember the coronavirus um, uses the ACE2 receptor to get into cells. Um, so at that point when the virus uh, attaches to the cell the uh, membrane of the virus will sort of open the envelope uh, and this will release the nucleocapsid as well as the viral uh, genome into the uh, cytoplasm of the host cell. Uh, and with the HIV, um, it also carries this reverse transcriptase uh, and this allows the genome to then be converted from RNA into DNA. And then because it's, uh, well, retroviruses by nature, what they do is they, uh, the DNA will then travel into the nucleus uh, of the host cell and then integrate into the genome and it will usually stay latent for a certain amount of time uh, and, and at some point it will begin to be expressed and so when the HIV genome is expressed it's going to produce um, new HIV genomes as well it's going to produce um, these mRNAs that then travel out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm again uh, and then the translational machinery within the cytoplasm, the human translational machinery, is going to recognize these mRNAs that have been spliced in a specific way to make different proteins and then these specific HIV proteins are going to travel to different parts of the cell, a lot of them to the plasma membrane eventually, uh, where these viral genomes as well as these uh, proteins sort of congregate and bud out to form new viral particles. So this is just a very like generalized overview of the HIV replication life cycle. Um, and so the idea here is that, oh, and I want to also mention that um, these HIV particles look nothing like coronavirus particles. Um, it's kind of like, so here you have the coronavirus particles uh, with these large spike proteins um, that are very noticeable as I showed you previously in the electron micrograph uh, in my last video. Um, HIV does not contain those spike um, proteins. Um, so really, they are both viral particles, but it's kind of like comparing two different cars. Um, you know, obviously you can tell different car types apart made by different companies, um, because even though they're both cars, they look quite different. Um, so to scientists, um, to virologists, of course you can tell the difference between HIV and coronavirus particles. Uh, but really when we start to get back to the quote here, um, this same cell, this T cell that the HIV has infected, um, it can also produce exosomes, of course, as, as many cells can. And so here, if you have an endosome here or a multivesicular body that's produced these exosomes, if these exosomes are being produced in a cell with all of this viral replication going on, the idea is that these exosomes can actually contain uh, or resemble HIV by containing genetic material from the HIV as well as having proteins from the HIV. So in this way, this viral particle can actually sort of represent HIV or resemble it. Um, sorry, this is not a viral particle, this is an exosome. So this exosome can resemble a viral particle, an HIV viral particle. Okay, and this is really the Trojan exosome hypothesis that James Hildreth, James Hildreth is speaking about. And the reason this is important is because, um, oh, let me just also say that this uh, exosome, the, the way that it actually works, the way this Trojan exosome hypothesis works is that on the outside layer of this exosome, it's going to contain cellular human uh, MHC, usually it's called HLA, but in this document it's referred to as MHC. Uh, MHC HIV peptide complexes. 
And I'm not going to get into the idea of antigen presentation, but really what this is saying is that this exosome can actually target these T cells uh, and mimic uh, an antigen presenting cell from a person. So in this way, this exosome can then increase HIV infectivity by attaching to more T cells, not in the way that you see here, but actually attaching as if it's a host cell trying to present something that the T cell might want to fight. Um, and so in this way, this makes the virus actually more infective. This is sort of a trick that's being proposed that the HIV virus uses to increase its own infectivity by use of these MHC HIV peptide complexes on these exosomes. So this is kind of a brief overview of the Trojan exosome hypothesis. Um, it's a little bit long-winded. I summarize it better in the next slide. Um, but really, this is predicated on the idea that HIV is a real virus, okay? and that exosomes are the result of a viral infection. So these exosomes are um, containing HIV um, genome sequences as well as peptides only with HIV present. So in no way does this represent anything Andrew Kaufman talks about, about how these exosomes are going to be produced uh, as, as far as an insult and then misdiagnosed or misrepresented as viruses. This uh, idea of the virus fully an exosome in every sense of the word is specific to HIV. It's not talking about coronaviruses, and it's specific to this um, theory uh, or idea hypothesis about um, this specific cycle. Okay, and so really, um, this is the original paper here. Uh, the virus is fully an exosome in every sense of the word. There's the quote, and here it even states that exosomes make a perfect vector for HIV. Vector just means you're carrying something. Um, because an exosome is not just proteins in a vesicle, it's something that is meant to traffic. All right, so this is just me sort of uh, summarizing the Trojan exosome hypothesis by James Hildreth. Exosomes during an HIV infection can act as vectors for HIV by mimicking antigen presentation of viral peptides by MHC complexes. In this way, HIV can trick CD4 plus T cells into thinking they are fighting HIV, thereby allowing HIV to infect and kill more CD4 plus T cells. So this is a very nice hypothesis, and Dr. James Hildreth has been working on this for much of his career. A lot of his research has gone into this. So I really find it sort of insulting for Andrew Kaufman to take the research of a man um, who at no point in his career was he trying to mislead the public or cause a lockdown or anything related to this um, coronavirus uh, pandemic. He's just been working on this as his research and Andrew Kaufman has just taken his name and trying to really give him a bad reputation, um, you know, bringing him into these conspiracy theories and crazy ideas that aren't scientific at all. So I just want everyone to understand that uh, this is a respectable person in the field of immunology and uh, he should remain that way regardless of what Andrew Kaufman says. All right, so you could really get a, a case of broken telephone here. Um, so this is another YouTube comment. Uh, Kaufman is no liar. He is articulate and accurate in his analysis. He clearly identifies that COVID-19 is indis indistinguishable from an exosome. Again, if you watch the previous video, I can show you that's not true. Uh, and for comparative analysis, he directly quotes the eminent Dr. James Hildreth, who when describing HIV concluded the, the virus is fully an exosome in every sense of the word. Again, this is not in context at all. Um, it really is actually irrelevant to the whole coronavirus situation to COVID-19. There's no uh, relation between this quote and anything that's happening now or any of the pathology related to COVID-19, okay? Um, so really this concerns me because these people are sort of um, blindly uh, following, um, it's kind of like a cult-like following of what Andrew Kaufman is saying. And I think I know why this is. Um, because Andrew Kaufman in the way he speaks is really overgeneralizing his claims in a non-scientific way. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that here. Um, so just listen to him talk here for a second. This is during an interview with uh, Brian Rose on London Real. Well, you know, all of this research and, and all of our common uh, understandings about things like viruses and contagion is all built on the, the foundation that germs cause disease, and specifically viruses. Okay, so I don't know if you guys noticed what he did there, but he used the word all quite often. He says all of our scientific knowledge, all of our research, all of it is based on this. Um, scientists don't really speak like that. 
So um, you could use these words, there's nothing wrong with using the word all, but when you overgeneralize something like all of research, all of science, um, really what he's saying is that he somehow has this amazing understanding of all of the literature and that all of it is wrong. Um, so for people to blindly follow this, um, it's a little concerning. I mean, um, it's not something I would do, but I really encourage people to try to think a little more critically uh, when you hear people saying these, these very bold positive statements about huge things like all of science or things like that, okay? Um, so really, uh, back to the misquoting of James Hildreth, um, he's misrepresenting scientific information to fit his theories. Um, and he's doing a limited use of resources. He's really using these basic Google searches uh, to get a lot of this information. Uh, and he's using it to make these very odd correlations that you know really don't have any scientific backing. Uh, and he's also blatantly misquoting scientific literature to people who are uneducated in the sciences, like much of his followers. So for people who don't know much about science, if you misquote it and misrepresent these uh, papers in this way, you're really uh, doing an injustice to the science and also to your audience because you're really giving people wrong information. So it, it kind of confuses them um, and it's teaching them the wrong thing. And so really here are my concerns with Andrew Kaufman. He is articulate, as that comment said. He's very easy to believe and he does seem trustworthy. So this makes it a little bit more concerning. Um, he's also intelligent. Um, so this leads me, this, this is a bad thing in, uh, as far as my eyes goes because um, he knows exactly what he is doing and he chooses to misrepresent the scientific literature to fit his agenda. Um, and he's also very motivated. So you, someone might ask the question, why would he put in this effort? So now I'm going to sort of just drop off the science for a second uh, and do a little bit of a brainstorming activity. Um, this is not a personal attack on him in any way, but this is just uh, a way that someone might try to reconcile why somebody would put all this effort into presenting misinformation. So really what Andrew Kaufman might be doing here is a little bit of marketing, um, similar to what David Icke has done in building a large fan base. So David Icke is a well-published author. He's written several books um, and you know he's been working very hard uh, at talking about his ideas. And as well, he does these live events where he uh, gets people to buy tickets and listen to him talk for six to 12 hours. Um, and this is a very good business model. It works very well. Um, it's a similar business model that's used by these preachers who uh, they speak about religion. So maybe David Icke here is speaking about conspiracy theories. Um, whereas uh, Benny Hinn here, uh, who's a famous preacher, is speaking about religion. Uh, both of them uh, have very successful business models where people want to listen to them, uh, talk about what they talk about. Um, so if Andrew Kaufman is possibly doing something like this, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people have businesses of all kinds. It's a free market. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Really, the problem here comes when someone tries to misrepresent science or misrepresent the quotes um, by scientists um, about certain scientific topics that, they're, um, that they've been studying. So if Andrew Kaufman is saying, Carrie Mullis said this, therefore, you know, whatever he says, or um, James Hildreth quotes the virus is fully an exosome in every sense of the word, therefore Andrew Kaufman's theory is correct. Um, this is where I have an issue. So uh, I would just say if this is something that's going on, all the power to anyone who wants to write books um, and start a business of this nature, but try to not represent, uh, misrepresent science in the process. Okay, so um, thanks for listening. Um, please click a thumbs up if you like the video and feel free to subscribe to my channel.